Chapter 19 of Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke. Chapter 19 Buffalo Bill's Pards of the Plains. To gain great local and national fame as a Plains celebrity in the days of old was not an easy task, rather one of the most competitive struggles that a young man could possibly engage in. The vast, comparatively unknown, even called great, American desert of twenty-five and thirty years ago was peopled only by the descendants of the sturdy pioneers of the then far west, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, Iowa, Minnesota, Kansas, etc., born raised and used to hardships and danger and attracted only the resolute determined adventurers of the rest of the world seeking an outlet for pent-up natures imbued with love and daring adventure hundreds of men achieved local and great numbers national fame for the possession of every manly quality that goes to make up the romantic hero of that once dark and bloody ground when it was brought to mind the work engaged in the carving out of the advanced paths for the most domestically inclined settler, of the dangers and excitement of the hunting and trapping, of carrying dispatches, stage driving, freighting cargoes of immense value, guiding successfully the immense wagon trains, gold hunting. It is easy to conceive what a class of sturdy, adventurous young spirits entered the arena to struggle in a daily, deadly, dangerous game to win the bubble reputation when such an army of the best human material battled for supremacy individual distinction gained by the unwritten law of unprejudiced popular promotion possessed a value that made its acquirer a plains celebrity stamped indelibly with an honored title rarely possessed unless fairly openly and justly won a prize so pure that its ownership while envied crowned the victor with the friendship following and admiration of the contestants thus boone crockett Carson, Beale, Fremont, Cody, Bridger, Kinman, Hickok, Cosgrove, Comstock, Frank North, and the others will live in the romance, the poetry, and history of their distinctive work forever. The same spirit and circumstances have furnished journalists innumerable, who in the West imbibed the sterling qualities they afterward used to such effect, Notably, Henry M. Stanley, who, in 1866, saw the rising sun of the young empire that stretches to the Rockies, General Greeley of Arctic fame, and the equally scientific explorer Lieutenant Schwatka, passed their early career in the same school, and often followed the trail led by Buffalo Bill, Finnerty, formerly of the Chicago Times, Modoc Fox and O'Kelly of the New York Herald in 1876 while of late years the scribblers were initiated to their baptism by fire by Harry's of Washington Star, McDonough, New York World, Bailey of Inter Ocean, Brave Young Kelly of the Lincoln Journal, Cressy of the Omaha Bee, Charlie Seymour, Chicago Herald, Allen of the New York Herald, Robert J. Boylan of Inter Ocean, present in the battle, who were honored by three cheers from the old white top Forsyth's gallant 7th Calvary the day after the Battle of Wounded Knee, as they went charging over Wolf Creek, to what came near being a crimson day, to the fight down at the mission. That there was still successors to every king is assured by the manly scouts so prominent in this last Indian war and such men as Frank Garrard, now the most celebrated of the present employed army scouts, of Little Bat, true as steel and active as a cougar, Philip Wells, Louis Shangrell, Big Peptiste, and John Shangrell, while the friendly Indians furnished such grand material for any future necessity as No Neck, Major Sword, Red Shirt, and Yankton Charlie. Wild Bill, J. B. Hickok it is a noticeable coincidence that nearly all of the famous frontier characters are natives of the West, and J.B. Hickok, better known as Wild Bill, was not an exception to the rule. Born in LaSalle County, Illinois, in 1837, his earliest desire was for horses and firearms. At the age of 14, he had become known as a wolf killer, for at that time the country where he lived was overrun by them. 
acquiring a rudimental education he started out to earn his living and began as a towpath driver on the illinois and michigan canal longing for fields of adventure he went into kansas where he soon made a name in the border war then going on there it was in kansas that he was given the name of bill though just why no one seems to know and afterward his daring and adventurous career got for him the added cognomen of wild bill a name that he certainly made famous serving upon the frontier as wagon boss pony rider stage driver and then drifting into the position of guide and government scout wild bill made a name for himself in each occupation he followed it was while serving as train boss of one of russell and major's wagon trains that wild bill met and befriended buffalo bill then a mere boy and the friendship thus begun ended only with the death of hickok at deadwood at the hands of the assassin jack mccall a soldier scout and spy during the civil war wild bill returned to scouting at its close the frontier becoming his home constantly he was thrown in the company of buffalo bill and when the latter decided to go upon the stage he determined that his companions in the enterprise should be wild bill and texas jack and they accompanied him to the east a dead shot an enemy to fear wild bill was as brave as a lion and as tender-hearted as a woman and he will go down in history as a true hero of the border texas jack j b amahandro known in his native state virginia as john b amahandro the subject of this sketch won the sobriquet of Texas Jack after service as a ranger in the Lone Star State. Reared in a part of Virginia where every man rode a horse and born a natural hunter, while his parents were able to gratify his desire to become a skilled horseman and expert shot, Jack Amahandro at an early age became noted among his comrades as a fearless rider and a dead shot. When the Civil War broke out, though but a boy, Jack enlisted in the Confederate cavalry, and during the four years saw much hard service and was a participant in many battles. Becoming connected with the headquarters of a Texas general, he was made a scout, and as such rendered valuable services to the Confederate Army. Allied with Texans, he went with them to Texas at the close of the war, going to the frontier where he joined a company of rangers. From ranger, in which capacity he saw much service against the Indians, he turned to cattle herding, becoming first a cowboy and afterward a rancher. Going northward into Kansas in charge of a large herd of cattle, Texas Jack met, at a frontier post, Buffalo Bill. A warm friendship at once sprung up between the two, which ended only with the death of the gallant Texan some years ago at Leadville, Colorado. It was through the agency of Buffalo Bill that Texas Jack entered the service of the government as a scout and won distinction as such and also as guide and Indian fighter. As a scout, he was respected by Army officers for his skill and courage, and he became the warm friend of White Beaver, Dr. Frank Powell, Major Frank North, and Wild Bill, joining the latter with Buffalo Bill in the theatrical enterprise which Buffalo Bill continued until he originated the Wild West exhibition. Dr. D. Frank Powell, White Beaver The life of White Beaver, Dr. D. Frank Paul, bears all the colors and shades of an idyllic romance. His character stands out upon the canvas of human eccentricities in striking originality and never finds its counterpart save in stories of knight errantry when hearts, names, and titles were the prizes bestowed for daring deeds evolved from generous sentiments. His has been the tenor of uneven ways, with characteristics as variable as the gifts in Pandora's box. A born plainsman with the rough, rugged marks of wild and checkered incident, and yet a mind that feeds on fancy, builds images of refinement, and looks out through the windows of his soul upon visions of purity and feels elation. A reckless adventurer on the boundless prairies, and yet in elegant society as amiable as a schoolgirl in the ballroom, evidencing the polish of an aristocrat and a cultured mind that shines with vigorous luster where learning displays itself a friend to be valued most in direst extremity, and an enemy with implacable, insatiable, and revengeful animosities. In short, he is a singular combination of opposites, and yet the good in him so predominates over his passions that no one has more valuable friendships and associations 
than these strange complexities attract to him he is an ideal hero the image which rises before the ecstatic vision of a romancer and he impresses himself upon the millions who know his reputation as a brave and chivalrous gentleman a description of white beaver is not difficult to give because of his striking features those who see him once are so impressed with his bearing that his image is never forgotten he is almost six feet in height a large frame and giant muscular development a full round face set off by a grecian nose a handsome mouth and black eyes of penetrating brilliancy his hair is long and hangs over his shoulders in raven ringlets in action he is marvelously quick always decisive and his endurance almost equals that of a steam engine his appearance is that of a resolute high-toned gentleman conscious of his power and yet his deference i may say amiability attracts everyone to him he is in short one of the handsomest as well as most powerful men among the many great heroes of the plains in addition to his other qualifications peculiarly fitting him for a life on the plains he is an expert pistol and rifle shot in fact there are perhaps not a half dozen persons in the united states who are his superiors his precision is not so great now as it once was for the reason that during the past three or four years he has had but very little practice but even now he would be regarded an expert among the most skillful for dead center shooting at stationary objects he never had a superior his eyesight is more acute than an eagle's which enables him to distinguish and hit the head of a pin ten paces distant and this shot he can perform now nine times out of ten any of his office employees will hold the copper scent between their fingers and let him shoot it out at ten paces so great is their confidence in his skill he also shoots through finger rings held in the same manner one very pretty fancy shot he does is splitting a bullet on a knife blade he also suspends objects by a hair and at ten paces cuts the hair which of course he cannot see but shoots by judgment several persons have told me that they have seen him shoot a fish line in two while it was being dragged swiftly through the water white beaver and buffalo bill have been bosom friends and fellow plainsmen since boyhood history records no love between two men greater than that of these two foster brothers major frank j north this gallant officer was universally recognized as one of the best executive leaders and bravest men that ever faced the dangers of the plains although born in the state of new york march tenth eighteen forty he was by virtue of his training a thorough westerner while still a boy his father moved from new york to near columbus in the state of nebraska and very soon thereafter was frozen to death at emigrant crossing on big papillion creek while searching for wood for his suffering family after a short connection with mcmira glass and messenger a party of trappers he returned to columbus and turned his hand to anything that offered in eighteen sixty at the age of twenty years he procured employment with agent de pie at the pawnee indian reservation while there he studied and became thoroughly proficient in the pawnee language and in the following year was engaged as interpreter by mr rudy son-in-law of the indian commissioner in eighteen sixty four when the sioux war broke out he was commissioned by general curtis to organize the pawnee scouts he formed a company of seventy seven young warriors and was made first lieutenant to major north belongs the honor of making the first enlistment of indians for regular government service in october following lieutenant north supplemented his first enlistment by another of one hundred pawnee warriors who were equipped as regular cavalry and he was promoted to the rank of captain in january eighteen sixty five captain north with forty of his pawnee braves started in pursuit of the sioux who had been committing terrible outrages in the neighborhood of julesburg death and destruction marked the trail of the sioux and captain north arrived in julesburg just in time to rescue its inhabitants still pursuing he caught up with a party of twenty-eight of the red devils and not one of them escaped his vengeance this was a part of red cloud's forces and only a few days before they had suddenly attacked lieutenant collins and fourteen men and massacred the entire party shortly after this he became the hero of one of the most daring fights ever recorded during the pursuit of a party of twelve cheyennes with the intention of punishing them for atrocities committed in the neighborhood of fort sedgwick 
his impetuous ardor was so great that it led him far in advance of his followers he suddenly realized that he was at least a mile ahead of his men after bringing down one of the fleeing cheyennes he turned to rejoin his command seeing him alone the indian started in pursuit and his horse having been killed he was compelled to continue his retreat on foot after having gone some distance he remembered he had left two loaded revolvers in the holsters on his saddle and notwithstanding the danger he boldly returned for them and with them fought the cheyennes single-handed for nearly half an hour longer until relieved by lieutenant small in eighteen sixty five eighteen sixty six after the pawnees were mustered out of service captain north was appointed post trader at the pawnee reservation in the march following under orders from general auger he raised a battalion of two hundred pawnees who were equipped for cavalry service and taken to fort kearney he being commissioned a major this battalion guarded construction trains on the union pacific railroad until it reached ogden upon the completion of the road major north retired to a ranch on dismal river near north platte where he went into the cattle raising business he was then a great sufferer from asthma and had abandoned all hope of relief buffalo bill and major north met for the first time at fort mcpherson and served together in several campaigns they became very warm friends and afterward partners in the cattle business under the firm name of cody and north major north besides being a remarkable indian fighter and a phenomenally brave man was a thorough gentleman of generous and noble instincts an honest friend and popular with all classes his death a few years ago at north platte was deeply and sincerely regretted by the many who had known and loved him well to none did the news cause more sincere regret than to his old pard and partner buffalo bill sitting bull though nearly a score of years have gone by since the battle of little bighorn where the gallant custer and his brave band were slain the name of sitting bull is recalled by all and a sigh of relief went up all along the border when the news came that the noted chief had started upon the trail for the happy hunting grounds those who condemn the indian for his red deeds should remember that it is his education to be a savage to kill and to burn and pillage that the greatest slayer of mankind in the opinion of the red man is the greatest hero thus considering that the indian has his story to tell as well as a white man the mantle of charity should be drawn over their deeds sitting bull was not a chief in the true sense of the word but was the moses of his people he had unlimited influence with his tribe and among other tribes as well and a mighty medicine man he claimed as well to be a prophet the career of sitting bull was eventful and remarkable he was a leader and a schemer and when generals terry crook and gibbon were sent to capture him he showed great generalship in all that he did he checked the advance of general crook slaughtered custer and escaped into canada where he and his people were safe in eighteen seventy seven a part of sitting bull's tribe surrendered to general miles who pressed them so hard they could not escape into canada in eighteen eighty others of the tribe surrendered to general miles at fort q and later sitting bull and others surrendered to keep from starving they were transferred to standing rock agency sitting bull received tempting offers to go east on expedition but refused all except one from buffalo bill whom he knew was a deadly foe in warfare and a good friend in times of peace and so went with some of his people to join the wild west with which he remained for a year the killing of sitting bull is still fresh in the minds of the people and his taking off has been condemned by many at the time of his death buffalo bill surgeon frank powell pony bob haslam and others were on their way to his camp to demand his surrender had buffalo bill not been halted by the command of the president and had reached sitting bull's camp the great chief would not have been slain and probably cody's influence would have been strong enough to have changed to a more peaceful settlement the emuit that culminated in wounded knee and pine ridge oklahoma payne captain d l payne the cimarron scout david l payne known throughout the west as captain payne of the oklahoma colony company was born in grant county indiana december thirtieth eighteen thirty six in eighteen fifty eight with his brother 
he started west intending to engage in the mormon war but reached there too late he settled in donovan county texas his commercial pursuits there not resulting in success he turned hunter and so became thoroughly acquainted with the topography of the great southwest afterward a scout he was often engaged in that capacity by the government and by private expeditions in this way he became acquainted with kit carson wild bill buffalo bill california joe general custer and others of national reputation during the civil war he served as a private in the fourth regiment which was afterward merged into the tenth in the fall of eighteen sixty four he was elected to the kansas legislature upon its adjournment he again enlisted and his command was detailed for duty at washington city his service in the volunteer army covered a period of eight years his last position being captain of company h nineteenth kansas cavalry from october eighteen sixty eight to october eighteen sixty nine during these eight years he held the position of postmaster at fort leavenworth member of the legislature and sergeant-at-arms of the kansas senate at the close of the war captain payne returned to the life of the plains and in the spring of eighteen sixty eight he accompanied general custer in an expedition against the cheyennes during which he with two others was detailed as special messenger to fort hayes to secure assistance and in that capacity encountered great dangers and privations in eighteen seventy he removed to sedgwick county kansas near wichita and in the following year was again elected to the legislature in eighteen seventy nine he became interested in a movement for the occupation and settlement of a district in the indian territory which is known as oklahoma beautiful land in eighteen eighty he organized a colony for the purpose of entering upon and settling these lands but was stopped by a decision of carl schurz then secretary of the interior to the effect that these lands were open to settlement only to negroes or indians owing to the arrest of captain payne by the united states authorities the colony disbanded however historians may differ as to the wisdom or legality of captain payne's so-called oklahoma invasion and the court's decisions upon the subject the fact remains that his name is held high in honor and esteem by the older citizens of the now flourishing oklahoma a monument to his forethought nathan salisbury now to one who if not a part of the plains is a partner in the wild west mr nate salisbury the partner of buffalo bill in his business enterprise of the wild west and his devoted friend was born in freeport illinois his parents being in humble circumstances nate salisbury began to work for a living at an early age his ambition being to win fame and fortune by becoming a self-made man as there was little to bind his affections to the home of his nativity when the war broke out with all the patriotism of an american stirring in his bosom he enlisted as a private in the fifteenth illinois regiment though but a boy in years his career as a boy soldier won for him praise and promotion and he was wounded in battle on three different occasions made a prisoner by the confederates he was incarcerated in andersonville prison where he remained for seven months being at length exchanged he returned to his home and began the study of law a few months of office work and attendance at school as well impressed him with the idea that the legal profession would still have a fairly large membership even though his name was not added to the list abandoning his intention of becoming a lawyer and while attending school he was selected for a part in an amateur theatrical performance from the time that he made his first bow to an audience before the floodlights as an amateur he was seized with the irresistible desire to become an actor with nate salisbury to decide was to act and going to grand rapids michigan with only a few dollars in his pocket he received a position which though humble gave him a start in professional life after a short season there he went east and secured a position in the boston museum company where his histrionic talent was quickly recognized by the management his success at this theater soon attracted to him the attention of managers of other cities and he accepted the position of leading man at hooley's theater in chicago his progress was thenceforth rapid his popularity grew apace and his salary was added to with every engagement there was too much originality in nate salisbury to allow of his remaining a member of a stock company 
so he conceived and constructed a comedy entertainment to which he gave the title of the troubadours from the first production of the troubadours the fame and fortune of nate salisbury were assured his play of patchwork followed then his most successful comedy the brook which added largely to his riches and his name as an actor mr salisbury went with his troubadours in a trip around the world everywhere receiving deserved praise and he was the first dramatic manager who made this hazardous tour with his own company the tour took the troubadours after going all over the united states playing from maine to texas the carolinas to california through australia india scotland england ireland and wales wherever the english tongue was spoken meeting buffalo bill and learning from him his intention of giving wild western exhibitions mr salisbury became a partner in the wild west and took the active management of that gigantic aggregation withdrawing from the stage to do so during the tour of buffalo bill abroad at many dinners and assemblages mr nate salisbury's oratorical powers mimic skill ready wit recitative talent and facility of expressing sentiment delighted all who heard him and invariably made an impression that will long keep his memory green while the reputation of americans for oratory was well sustained by the prairie-born boy soldier as a proof of mr salisbury's nerve under trying circumstances he was about to go upon the stage at denver when he received a dispatch from his partner buffalo bill which told him that the wild west steamer on the mississippi had collided with another boat and sunk buffalo bill telegraphed the whole outfit at the bottom of the mississippi river what do you advise without an instant's hesitation nate salisbury wrote on a telegraph blank this answer go to new orleans reorganize and open on your date and this buffalo bill did some years ago mr salisbury invested heavily in the cattle business in montana and today owns one of the most valuable ranches in the northwest it was during his visit to his ranch that he saw the practicability of an exhibition such as the wild west and readily joined buffalo bill in the enterprise a man of brains a strict disciplinarian a genial gentleman with genius to originate and ability to accomplish generous and courageous nate salisbury stands to-day unrivalled as an executive of great amusement enterprises and he thoroughly deserves the fortune and fame that he has won indian names of states massachusetts from the indian language signifying the country about the great hills Connecticut was Mohegan, spelled originally Quanedicut, signifying a long river. Alabama comes from an Indian word signifying the land of rest. Mississippi derived its name from that of the great river, which is in the Natchez tongue, the father of waters. Arkansas is derived from the word Kansas, smoky waters, with the French prefix of arc, a bow. Tennessee is an Indian name meaning the river with a big bend. Kentucky is also an Indian name, Kintuke, signifying at the head of the river. Ohio is the Shawnee name for the beautiful river. Michigan's name was derived from the lake, the Indian name for fish weir or trap, which the shape of the lake suggested. Indiana's name came from that of the Indians. Illinois' name is derived from the Indian word Illini, men, and the French affix oi, making tribe of men. Wisconsin's name is said to be the Indian name for a wild, rushing channel. Missouri is also an Indian name for muddy, having reference to the muddiness of the Missouri River. Kansas is an Indian word for smoky water. Iowa signifies, in the Indian language, the drowsy ones, and Minnesota, a cloudy water. End of chapter 19 Read by Thomas Thorson Chapter 20 of Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke Chapter 20 Border Poetry Bill Cody 
You bet I know him, partner. He ain't no circus fraud. He's western born and western bred if he has been laid abroad. I knew him in the days way back beyond Missouri's flow, when the country round was nothing but a huge wild western show. When the engines were as thick as fleas, and the man who ventured through the sand hill of Nebraska had to fight the hostile Sioux. These were hot times, I tell you, and we all remember still the days when Cody was a scout, and all the men knew Bill. I knew him first in Kansas in the days of sixty eight, when the Cheyennes and Arapahoes were wiping from the slate old scores against the settlers, and when men who wore the blue with shoulder straps and way up rank were glad to be helped through by a bearer of dispatches who knew each vale and hill from Dakota down to Texas, and his other name was Bill. I mind me too of seventy nine the time when Cody took his scouts upon the Rosebud, along with General Crook, when Custer Seventh rode to their death for lack of some such aid, to tell them that the sneaking Sioux knew how to ambuscade. I saw Bill's fight with Yellowhand. You bet it was a mill. He downed him well at thirty yards, and all the men cheered Bill. They tell me that the women folk now take his word as laws. In them days laws were mighty scarce, and hardly passed with squaws. But many a hardy settler's wife and daughter used to rest, more quietly, because they knew of Cody's dauntless breast. Because they felt from Laramie way down to old Fort Sill, Bill Cody was a trusted scout, and all their men knew Bill. I haven't seen him much of late. How does he bear his years? They say he's making ducats now from shows and not from steers. He used to be a judge of horns when poured in a tin cup, and left the wine to tender feet and men who felt way up. Perhaps he cracks a bottle now. Perhaps he's had his fill. Who cares? Bill Cody was a scout, and all the world knows Bill. To see him in his trimmings, he can't hardly look the same, with laundered shirt and diamonds as if he'd run a game. He didn't wear biled linen then, or flash up diamond rings. The royalties he dreamed of then were only pasteboard kings. But those who sat behind the queens were apt to get their fill, in the days when Cody was a scout, and all the men knew Bill. William E. Annan, Omaha B. Washington, D.C., February 28, 1891. Buffalo Chips the Scout to Buffalo Bill The following verses on the life and death of poor old Buffalo Chips are founded entirely on facts. His death occurred on September 8, 1876, at Slim Buttes. He was within three feet of me when he fell, uttering the words credited to him below. Captain Jack Crawford, Poet Scout the evening sun were settin', droppin' slowly in the west, and the soldiers, tired and tuckered in the camp, would find that rest, which the settin' sun would bring em, for they'd marched since break o' day, not a bite to eat cept horses as war killed upon the way. For ye see our beans and crackers and our pork were out in sight, and the boys expected rations when they struck our camp that night, for a little hand had started for to bring some cattle on and they struck an Indian village, which they captured just at dawn. While I were with that party when we captured them our Sioux, and we quickly sent a courier to tell old Crook the news. Old Crook, I should say general, cause he wore with the boys, shared his only hardtack, our sorrows and our joys, and there is one thing sartin he never put on style. He greet the scouter soldier with a social kinder smile, and that's the kind of soldier as the prairie likes to get, and every man would trump death's ace for crook or miles, you bet. But I'm kinder off the racket, cause these generals get enough of praise without my chippin', so I'll let up on that puff, for I want to tell a story about a mate of mine as fell, cause I loved the honest feller, and he did his duty well. Buffalo Chips, we'd call him, but his other name wore white, 
I'll tell ye how he got that name, and reckon I am right. You see a lot of big bugs and officers came out one time to hunt the buffaler and fish for speckled trout. While little Phil, ye've heard on him, a dainty little cuss, as rode his charger twenty miles to stop a little muss. Well, Phil, he said to Jonathan, whose other name were White, you go and find them buffaler and see you get em right. So White he went and found em, and he found em such a band, as he said would set him crazy and little Phil looked bland. But when the outfit halted, one bull was all were there. Then Phil, he called him Buffalo Chips, and swore a little swear. Well, White, he kinder liked it, cause the general called him Chips, and he used to wear two shooters in a belt above his hips. Then he said, Now look ye, general, since you've called me that ere name, just around them little sand hills is your doggone pesky game. But when the hunt were over and the table spread for lunch, the general called for glasses and wanted his in punch. And when the punch was punished, the general smacked his lips, while score upon the table sought a dish of buffalo chips. The general looked confounded, and he also looked for white. But Jonathan, he reckoned it were better he should light. So he skinned across the prairie, cause ye see he didn't mind a chippin' any longer while the general saw the blind. For the general would a raised him if he'd just held up his hand, but he thought he wouldn't see him cause he didn't hay the sand. And he rode as fast, ay, faster than the general did that day, like lightning down from Winchester some twenty miles away. Well, White said he had no cabin and no home to call his own, so Buffler Bill he took him and shared with him his home and how he loved Bill Cody, by gosh it wore a sight, to see him watch his shadow and follow him at night. Cause Bill were kinda hated by a cussed gang of thieves, as carried pistols in their belts, and bowies in their sleeves. And Chips he never left him for fear he'd get a pill, nor would he think it mighty hard to die for Buffalo Bill. We used to mess together that our Chips and Bill and me, and ye oughter watch his movements, it would do ye good to see how he used to cook them vittles and gather lots of greens to mix up with the juicy pork and them unruly beans. And one cold, chillin' mornin' he bought a lot of corn and a little flask of liquor as cost fifty cents a horn. Though forty yards were nowhere, it was finished soon, ye bet. But friends, I promised someone, and I'm strong teetotal yet. Rattlin Joe's Prayer by Captain Jack Crawford Just pile on some more of them pine knots and squat yourself down on this skin. And Scotty let up on your growlin. The boys are all tired of your chin. Allegheny, just pass round the bottle and give the lads all a square drink. And as soon as you're settled, I'll tell ye a yarn, as'll please ye, I think. "'Twas eighteen hundred and sixty, a day in the bright month of June, "'when the angel of death from the diggings snatched Monty Bill, known as McCune. "'While Bill were a favorite among us, in spite of the trade that he had, "'which were gambling, but don't you forget it, he often made weary hearts glad. "'And pards, while he lay in that coffin, which we hewed from the trunk of a tree, "'his face were as calm as an angel's, and white as an angel's could be. And that's where the troubles commenced, pards, that were no gospel sharps in the camps. And Joe said, we can't drop him this way without some directions or stamps. Then up spoke old Sandy McGregor, look ye yar, mates, I'm regular dead stuck. I can't hold no hand at religion, and I'm feared Bill's gone out of luck. If I'd knowed a darn thing about praying, I'd chip in and say him a mass. But I ain't got no show in the layout. I can't beat the game so I pass. Rattlin' Joe were the next of the speakers, and Joe were a friend of the dead. The salt water stood in his peepers, and these are the words as he said. Mates, ye know as I ain't any Christian, and I'll gamble the Lord don't know, that there lives such a rooster as I am, but there once war a long time ago, when I were a kid, I remember, my old mother sent me to school to the little brown church every Sunday, where they said I was dumb as a mule. And I reckon I've nearly forgotten pretty much all that I ever knew, 
but still if you'll drop to my racket i'll show you just what i can do now i'll show you my bible said joseph just hand me them cards off that rack i'll convince that this are a bible and he went to work shuffling the pack he spread out the cards on the table and begun kinder pious like pards if you'll just cheese your racket and listen i'll show you the prayer book and cards the ace that reminds us of one god the deuce of the father and son the tray of the father and son holy ghost for ye see all them three are but one the four spot is matthew mark luke and john the five spot the virgins who trimmed their lamps while it was yet light of day and the five foolish virgins who sinned the six spot in six days the lord made the world the sea and the stars and the heaven he saw were it good what he made then he said i'll just go the rest on the seven the eighth spot is noah his wife and three sons and noah's three sons had their wives god loved the whole mob so he bid em embark and the freshet he saved all their lives the nine were the lepers of biblical fame as repulsive and hideous squad the ten are the holy commandments which came to us perishing creatures from god the queen war of sheba in old bible times the king represents old king saul she brought in a hundred young folks gals and boys to the king in his government hall they were all dressed alike and she axed the old boy she'd put up his wisdom as bosh which were boys and which gals old saul said by joe how dirty their hands make em wash and then he showed sheba the boys only washed their hands and a part of their wrists while the gals just went up to their elbows in suds sheba weakened and shook the king's fists now the knave that's the devil and god if you please just keep his hands off and poor bill and now lads just drop on your knees for a while till i draw and perhaps i can fill and having no bible i'll pray on the cards for i've showed ye they're all on the square and i think god'll cotton to all that i say if i'm only sincere in the prayer just give him a corner good lord not on stocks for i ain't such a darn fool as that to ax ye for anything worldly for bill cause ye'd put me up then for a flat i'm lost on the rules of your game but i'll ax for a seat for him back of the throne and i'll bet my hull stack that the boy'll behave if your angels just lets him alone there's nothing bad bout him unless he gets riled the boys'll all back me in that but if any one treads on his corns then you bet he'll fight at the drop of the hat just don't let your angels run over him lord nor shut off all to once on his drink break him in kind of gentle and mild on the start and he'll give ye no trouble i think and couldn't ye give him a pack of old cards to amuse himself once in a while but i warn ye right here not to bet on his game or he'll get right away with your pile and now lord i hope ye've tuck it all in and listen to all that i've said i know that my praying is just a bit thin but I've done all I can for the dead. And I hope I hain't troubled your lordship too much, so I'll cheese it by axin' again, that you won't let the knave get his grip on poor Bill. That's all, Lord. Yours truly. Amen. That's Rattlin' Joe's prayer, old partners. And what, you're all snoring? Say, Lou, by thunder I've talked every rascal to sleep, so I guess I had best turn in, too. Buffalo Bill and Yellow Hand by Hugh A. Wetmore, Editor, People's Press. You may talk about duels requiring sand, but the slickest I've seen in any land was Buffalo Bill's with Yellow Hand. There want no seconds to split the pot, no newspaper bunkum, none of the rot. Your citified, dutified duels is got. Custer was not long into his shroud when a bunch of Cheyennes quit Red Cloud to join in the cranky Sittin' Bull crowd. It looked somewhat like a crazy freak, but Merritt's cavalry made a sneak to head the Reds at Big Bonnet Creek. Bill and some soldiers was on one side, for which Bill was actin' as chief and guide, when he get this call from the copper hide. I know ye long hair, yells Yellow Hand, a ridin' out from his pesky band, a regular bluff for the Injun brand. You kill heap Injun, I kill heap white, my people fear you by day or night, 
Come single-handed, and you me fight. I'll go ye, quick as a thunderclap, says Bill, whose jest didn't care a rap. Stand by and watch me in the varmint scrap. They was then bout fifty yards apart, when without a hitch they made a start, straight for each other, straight as a dart. The plug which was rid by that Cheyenne was plugged by a slug from Bill's rifle land. Bill's hoss stumbled, now twas man to man, or man to devil, if you like that best. But in them days in the sure enough west all stood as equals who stood the test. They next at twenty steps blazed away, and had they been equal both had been clay, but Bill was best, and he win their day. It's a good shot to hit an engine's heart, for obvious reasons. Bill weren't scared, and found the center without a chart. When they see Bill claim the tommyhawk, and feathers and beads wore by the gawk, the other engines began to squawk. It all happened so dad gasted quick, the opposition must have felt sick, but to my taste the duel was monstrous slick. The other engines made for Bill, but the soldiers met him on the hill, and convinced him they had best keep still. When Yellowhand Sr. heard the news, he offered ponies for Bill to let loose them trophies, but Bill he won no goose. With this remark I'll close my letter, there's not a engine can do, no matter what but a white man can do it better. End of chapter 20 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 21 of Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke. Chapter 21 From Prairie to Palace. In olden days, when a great leader of an army with banners was about to depart for a foreign country bent on conquest, great was the outpouring of the people loud sounded the drum and fife and gay bunting flirted with the joyous breeze salvos of artillery and great shouting rent the air and songs were sung in honor of the mighty host decked in all the glittering panoply of war all this in anticipation of the spoils of conquest to be brought back by the victor human prisoners coffers of gold or blood-bought titles to war one territory how different in spirit in action and in expression was the assemblage that bade godspeed to general w f cody on his departure as commander of the little heterogeneous army that sailed from columbia shores yet no leader ever started on a mission possible of such rich achievement none ever embarked upon a voyage destined to be so thoroughly and completely a tour of conquest and of glory his project included neither the shedding of blood the conquest of territory nor the enslaving of prisoners his was the mission of peace the awakening of the old world to the contemplation of fresh truths in the picturesque history of the new Columbus had told old Spain of the savages that greeted him on his landing upon the shores of the New World. The Pilgrim Fathers had sent messages of their terrible struggles with their bitter Indian foes. But General Cody took with him great chieftains, who called him friend. As evidences and traditions of the past, and for the delectation of peasant and prince across the water, they danced their war dance and sounded their war hoop but to the thoughtful it must have been a grander sight to see them in the hours not devoted to duty grouped in friendly conclave around the man who appearing first among them as a foe they had learned at last to understand and appreciate as their friend indeed what a lesson to power what an exemplification of the true spirit that moved the founders of the great american republic no compulsion was used by this hero of the plains to enforce the attendance of these bronzed warriors on his journeys but trusting to his word alone as the guerdon of their safety they willingly gladly went into a far country among scenes and people strangely new to them how appropriate 
that such an army under such a leader and on such a peaceful glorious invasion should carry into and plant in sturdy england sunny france historic spain mighty germany and poetic italy the flag that proclaims to all the world that all men are and by right ought to be free and equal before following the wild west of america in a mimic display across the seas into foreign lands it may be well to here consider something that this wonderful man among men has done in the way of educating our own and other people into knowing what the indian really is glancing now over the history of the indians we recall how cruel has been their mode of warfare and massacres innumerable rise up before us from the red scene in the wyoming valley to the death of the gallant custer and his brave three hundred boys in blue yet reared upon the frontier amid scenes of courage and learning from actual experience all the redskin could become as a foe buffalo bill yet accorded to them the rights that others would not allow if fighting them he yet would befriend them in time of need and was never merciless to them in defeat winning fame as scout guide and indian fighter buffalo bill was seized upon as a hero for the pen of the novelist and volumes have been written founded upon his deeds of daring then like a meteor he flashed upon the people of the east impersonating upon the stage none other than himself living over before the footlights his own life men who have criticized buffalo bill as an actor forget wholly that he is the only man who is playing himself he plays his part as he knows it as he has acted it upon many a field acting naturally and without bombast and forced tragic effect be the motive what it may be love of lucre or the gratification of pride the fact still remains that in his delineation of border life buffalo bill educated the people to seeing the hated and ever dreaded red man in another light he was their friend in peace not their foe always because once upon their trail and he brought the red man before the public in a way never witnessed before buffalo bill never was a man-killer and there was nothing of bravado in his nature and not a tinge of the desperado brought face to face with the stern reality that either his foe or himself must die when it was in the discharge of duty or self-defense william cody never quailed in the face of death and acted as his conscience dictated for the right but his stage appearance gave william cody the thought of producing border life upon a grander scale than could be done within the walls of a theatre and from this sprang the wild west exhibitions that have delighted the world conceiving the idea of presenting border life as it was before vast audiences he had once carried the thought into execution and buffalo bill's wild west became the centre of attention wherever it appeared after several times swinging around the circle in this country the wild west crossed the ocean in a steamship chartered to carry the vast aggregation and landed upon the shores of england behold the result opening in london before vast audiences the queen the prince of wales and other royal personages of high rank flocked to see the man and those he had brought with him into the very heart of the english metropolis there upon the soil of the mother country before tens of thousands of britishers the wild west held sway for months while the hero of the plains the prairie boy found himself honored by royalty a welcome visitor across the threshold of palaces fated by men whose names were known the world over bearing the stars and stripes in his hand mounted upon his finest charger 
buffalo bill saluted the queen who rose and bowed in salutation to the american flag borne by so fit a representative of his country nor did the triumphal march of the wild west end here for buffalo bill sought other lands to conquer and bore the stars and stripes into france spain italy germany austria belgium and elsewhere presenting the american flag before more peoples than it had ever been seen by during its existence of a century traveling through europe with three railway trains of seventy-five cars carrying over three hundred people with the horses of our plains the buffaloes and wild steers the wild west was the observed of all observers and crowned heads everywhere gave buffalo bill his cowboys and indians a welcome even his holiness the pope granting them an audience living in their own camp eating american food the people of the wild west did much to educate foreigners into a taste for american hams cornmeal and other luxuries and it was through the sending of so much corn to cody's commissary that colonel murphy of the department of agriculture won the name cornmeal murphy from this explanatory sketch the reader can readily see how it was that buffalo bill went from the prairie to the palace for the benefit of those of my readers who are interested in the study of physiognomy i submit the following physiognomical study of colonel cody by professor a j oppenheim b p a of london the length from the opening of the ear to the outer corner of the eye shows great intellectual capacity and quickness of comprehension the forehead is broad square and practical the deep setting of the eyes in their sockets denotes great shrewdness and keenness of perception the fullness under the eye means eloquence and the faculty of verbal expression the downward projection of the outer corner of the eyebrows means contest he never gives in the unevenness of the hair of the eyebrows shows hastiness of temper and irritability when under restraint but the straightness of the eyebrows themselves denotes truthfulness and sincerity the height of the facial bone generally indicates great intensity and strong powers of physical endurance the ridge in the center of the nose means relative defense protection kicksotism taking up other people's cudgels and fighting their battles for them the thinness of the bridge of the nose denotes generosity and love of spending money colonel cody might make many fortunes but he would never succeed in amassing one the length of the nostrils shows activity the manner in which they dilate and curl pride and their size denotes courage and fearlessness the transparency of the eyelids and the fineness of the eyelashes is indicative of a keenly sensitive sympathetic and benevolent nature though a large-sized man and a great warrior his heart is as tender as a woman's the angle of the jaw denotes determination and strength of purpose but the narrowness of the lower part of the face suggests a complete absence of coarseness or brutality the length of the throat shows a marvelous independence of spirit and love of fresh air and exercise the wavy lines in the forehead mean hope and enthusiasm the two perpendicular ones between the eyes love of equity and justice today buffalo bill stands as a typical plainsman the last of a race of men whose like will never be seen again the trackless wilderness the arid deserts mountains and plains are today as an open book through the work of just such pioneers of the star of empire as in buffalo bill they have solved the mysteries of the unknown land of the setting sun as it was half a century ago and then sprang into existence as educators and having done their work well are awaiting the last call to that great terra incognita beyond the river of death 
their like will never be seen again on this earth for there are no new lands to explore as columbus was the pilot across the seas to discover a new world such heroes as boone fremont crockett kit carson and last but by no means least cody were the guides to the new world of the mighty west and their names will go down in history as among the few the immortal names that were not born to die end of chapter twenty one recording by john brandon chapter twenty two of buffalo bill from prairie to palace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke. The Wild West at Sea. The Wild West visited many of the principal cities of this country, played a winter season in New Orleans, a summer season at Staten Island, and the winter of 1886 to 87 in Madison Square Garden in New York. But with the immortal bard who wrote, Ambition grows with what it feeds on. Colonel Cody and Mr. Salisbury had an ambition to conquer other nations. The importance of the undertaking was fully realized, but nothing daunted by all that would have to be undergone to reach a foreign land and give exhibitions, the owners of the Wild West boldly made the venture. The writer went abroad and arranged to play a season of six months in London as an adjunct of the American exhibition. All arrangements being made, the Indians were secured, the representative types of the Sioux, Cheyenne, Kiowas, Pawnees, and Ogallalas, and a number of prominent chiefs. Having collected a company of more than two hundred men and animals, consisting of Indians, cowboys, Mexican riders, rifle shots, buffaloes, Texas steers, burros, broncos, racing horses, elk, bear, and an immense amount of paraphernalia such as tents, wagons, stagecoach, arms, ammunition, costumes, and all equipage necessary, the steamship, City of Nebraska, Captain Braze, was chartered. The City of Nebraska, loaded with the Wild West, set sail from New York Thursday, March 31, 1887. The piers were crowded with thousands of good friends who went down to wave adieu and to wish the Wild West a pleasant voyage and success as the steamship city of nebraska pulled out of the dock the cowboy band played the girl i left behind me in a manner that suggested more reality than empty sentiment in the familiar air before starting on the trip a number of the indians had expressed grave fears about trusting themselves upon the mighty ocean fearing that a dreadful death would soon overtake them and it required much persuasion at the last moment to induce them to go on board. Red Shirt explained that these fears were caused by a superstitious belief that if a red man attempted to cross the ocean, he would be seized of a malady that would first prostrate the victim and then slowly consume his flesh, until, at length, the very skin itself would drop from his bones, leaving nothing but the skeleton, and this even would never find burial this weird belief was repeated by the chiefs of several tribes to the indians who had joined the wild west so there was little reason for wonder that the poor children of the forest should hesitate to submit themselves to such an experiment on the day following the departure from new york the indians began to grow weary and becoming seasick they were both treacherous and rebellious their fears were greatly intensified as even red shirt the bravest of his people looked anxiously toward the hereafter and began to feel his flesh to see if it was really diminishing the hopelessness stamped upon the faces of the indians was pitiful to behold and but for the endeavors of buffalo bill to cheer them up and relieve their forebodings there is no knowing what might have happened but for two days the whole company indians cowboys and all did little other active service than to feed the fishes 
on the third day all began to grow better and the indians were called into the salon and given a sermon by buffalo bill red shirt also having lost his anxiety joining in the oratory after the seasickness was over mr salisbury as singer and comedian took an active part in amusing all on board the seventh day of the voyage a fierce storm swept over the sea and the ship was forced to lay to and during its continuance the stock suffered greatly but only one horse died on the trip at last the steamship cast anchor off gravesend and a tugboat loaded with custom house and quarantine officers boarded to make the usual inspection the english government through its officials extended every courtesy a special permit was given for the animals to land and the people started for the camp the arrival of the city of nebraska had been watched for with great curiosity as a number of yachts tugboats and other craft surrounding it testified a tug was soon seen flying the stars and stripes and as it came nearer the strains of the star-spangled banner rendered by the band on her deck floated across the water as the welcome strains ended the cowboy band on the nebraska responded with yankee doodle when the tug came alongside the company on board proved to be the directors of the american exhibition in london with lord ronald gower heading a distinguished committee and representatives of the leading journals of england as buffalo bill landed with the committee three cheers were given and cries rang out of welcome to old england giving pleasing evidence of the public interest that had been awakened through the coming of the wild west a special train with saloon carriages was waiting to convey the party to london and leaving behind them the old kentish town in an hour after they arrived at victoria station entering the headquarters of the exhibition buffalo bill and those who accompanied him found a bounteous repast set and a generous welcome was accorded them after brief social converse a visit was made to the grounds where hundreds of busy workmen were hastening the completion of the arena the grandstand and stabling for the cattle when it is taken into consideration that these operations were dealing with an expenditure of over one hundred and thirty thousand dollars the greatness of the enterprise can be understood an arena of more than a third of a mile in circumference flanked by a grandstand filled with seats and boxes to accommodate twenty thousand persons sheltered stands for ten thousand more the standing room being ten thousand will give an idea of the size of the wild west exhibition grounds the interest evinced by the british workmen in the coming of the wild west people was as a straw indicating which way the wind blew or intended to blow on the following morning when the tide was at its flood the city of nebraska steamed up the river the trip being a pleasure to all on board with the assistance of the horsemen each looking after his own horse the unloading was begun and carried on with a rapidity that astonished even the old dock hands and officials through the courtesy of the custom-house people there was hardly a moment's delay in the debarkation but although landing in london the wild west was still twelve miles away from its city camp loading the entire outfit on two trains it was speedily delivered at the midland railway depot adjoining the grounds and by four o'clock on the same afternoon the horses and other animals had been stabled watered and fed and the camp equipage and bedding distributed the camp cooks were preparing the evening meal tents were going up stoves being erected tables spread and set in the open air teepees erected and by six o'clock a perfect canvas city had sprung up in the heart of west end london upon the flagstaff the starry banner had been run up and was floating in the breeze and the cowboy band rendering the national airs of america amid the shouts and cheers of thousands who lined the walls streets and housetops of the surrounding neighborhood this was most gratifying to the newcomers and in answer to the hearty plaudits of the english colonel cody 
ordered the band to play God Save the Queen, and the Wild West was at home in London. The first camp meal, being necessarily eaten in full view of the crowd, the dining tents not being ready, was a novel sight to them, from the motley population of Indians, cowboys, scouts, Mexicans, etc. The meal was finished by seven o'clock, and by nine o'clock the little camp was complete, and its tired occupants, men, women, and children, were reposing more snugly, safely, and peacefully than they had done in many weeks. Trivial as these details may appear at first sight, the rapidity with which the Wild West had transported its materials from dock to depot and depot to ground had an immense effect upon the people of London. A number of notable visitors present, especially the representatives of the press, expressed great astonishment at the enterprise of the Americans and communicated that feeling throughout London. The Yankees mean business, was the expression heard upon all sides. As the Wild West was not to open its exhibition for several days after its arrival, Colonel Cody and Mr. Salisbury had an opportunity of meeting many distinguished persons in England, who called upon them, and who afterward proved most friendly and hospitable. Among these prominent persons was Mr. Henry Irving, who had witnessed the Wild West performance at Staten Island, and paved the way in a great measure for its success in London by speaking in the kindest terms to a representative of the great dramatic organ, the Era. It may not be amiss to here quote his remarks. Mr. Irving said in The Era, I saw an entertainment in New York, the like of which I had never seen before, which impressed me immensely. It is coming to London. It is an entertainment in which the whole of the most interesting episodes of life on the extreme frontier of civilization in America are represented with the most graphic vividness and scrupulous detail. You have real cowboys with bucking horses, real buffaloes and great hordes of steers, which are lassoed and stampeded in the most realistic fashion imaginable. Then there are real Indians, who execute attacks upon coaches driven at full speed. No one can exaggerate the extreme excitement and go of the whole performance. It is simply immense, and I venture to predict that when it comes to London, it will take the town by storm. Among other early callers upon the Wild West, and who gave their influence and friendly aid in London, were genial John L. Toole, Miss Ellen Terry, Mr. Justin McCarthy, United States Minister Phelps, Consul General Governor Thomas Waller, Deputy Consul Moffat, Mr. Henry Labouchere, M.P., Miss Mary Anderson, Mrs. Brown Potter, Mr. Charles Wyndham, Lord Ronald Gower, Sir Cundiff Owen, Lord Henry Paget, Lord Charles Beresford, the Grand Duke Michael of Russia, Lady Monckton, Sir Francis Knollys, Private Secretary to the Prince of Wales, Colonel Clark, Colonel Montague, Lady Alice Becky, whom the Indians afterward named the Sunshine of the Camp, Lord Strathmore, Lord Windsor, Lady Randolph Churchill, Mrs. John W. Mackay, and a host of distinguished American residents in London, who also visited the camp before the regular opening of the Wild West, and, by their expressions of friendship, gave encouragement for success in the future. The sight of the Indians, cowboys, American girls, and Mexicans, with Buffalo Bill as chief, was most attractive to Londoners, while the English love of horsemanship, feats of skill, and fondness for sports presaged an appreciative community. The press was also most generous, the columns of the papers teeming daily with information so eulogistic that the wild westerners were afraid they would never be able to come up to expectations. Fifty large scrapbooks, filled to repletion with press notices, now form a conspicuous part of Colonel Cody's library at Scout's Rest Ranch. The London Illustrated News, in connection with two pages of illustration, 
is drawn upon for the following extract it is certainly a novel idea for one nation to give an exhibition devoted exclusively to its own frontier history or the story enacted by genuine characters of the dangers and hardships of its settlement upon the soil of another country three thousand miles away yet this is exactly what the americans will do this year in london and it is an idea worthy of that thoroughgoing and enterprising people we frankly and gladly allow that there is a natural and sentimental view of the design which will go far to obtain for it a hearty welcome in england the progress of the united states now the largest community of the english race on the face of the earth though not in political union with great britain yet intimately connected with us by social sympathies by a common language and literature by ancestral traditions and many centuries of common history by much remaining similarity of civil institutions laws morals and manners by the same forms of religions by the same attachments to the principles of order and freedom and by the mutual interchange of benefits in a vast commerce and in the materials and sustenance of their staple industries is a proper subject of congratulation for the popular mind in the united kingdom does not regard and will never be taught to regard what are styled imperial interests those of mere political dominion as equally valuable with the habits and ideas and domestic life of the aggregate of human families belonging to our own race the greater numerical proportion of these already exceeding sixty millions are inhabitants of the great american republic while the english-speaking subjects of queen victoria number a little above forty-five millions including those in canada and australasia and scattered among the colonial dependencies of this realm it would be unnatural to deny ourselves the indulgence of a just gratification in seeing what men of our own blood men of our own mind and disposition in all essential respects though tempered and sharpened by more stimulating conditions with some wider opportunities for exertion have achieved in raising a wonderful fabric of modern civilization and bringing it to the highest prosperity across the whole breadth of the western continent from the atlantic to the pacific ocean we feel sure that this sentiment will prevail in the hearts of hundreds of thousands of visitors to buffalo bill's american camp about to be opened at the west end of london and we take it kindly of the great kindred people of the united states that they now send such a magnificent representation to the motherland determined to take some part in celebrating the jubilee of her majesty the queen who is the political representative of the people of great britain and ireland the tone of this article strikes the same chord as the whole of the comments of the english press it divested the wild west of its attributes as an entertainment simply and treated the visit as an event of first-class international importance and a link between the affections of the two kindred nations such as had never before been forged end of chapter twenty two recording by linda johnson Chapter 23 of Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke. A Royal Welcome. While in the midst of extensive preparations for their opening, the proprietors of the wild west received an intimation that the ex-premier the right hon w e gladstone m p proposed honoring them with a preliminary call the date fixed for the visit was the twenty fifth of april and shortly after one o'clock p m on that day the distinguished visitor arrived at earl's court with mrs gladstone and accompanied by the marquis of lorne husband of the princess louise attended by lord ronald gower and mr waller consul general of the united states escorted by nate salisbury 
the cowboy band welcomed the visitors with the strains of yankee doodle and they were presently introduced to colonel cody who in turn presented to them the denizens of the encampment the grand old man was soon engaged in conversation with red shirt to whom colonel cody had explained that mr gladstone was one of the great white chiefs of england red shirt was much puzzled by mr gladstone's inquiring through an interpreter if he thought the englishman looked enough like the american for him to believe that they were kinsmen and brothers red shirt created quite a laugh by replying that quote, he wasn't quite sure about that end quote. it would be hard to picture the astonishment of the visitors when the indians in full war paint riding their swift horses dashed into the arena from an ambuscade and the enthusiasm grew immense when colonel cody placed himself at the head of the whole body and wheeled them into line for a general salute it was a real treat to see the ex-premier enjoying himself like a veritable schoolboy when the lasso the feats of shooting and the bucking horses were introduced and when the american cowboys tackled the incorrigible bucking horses he sometimes cheered the animal and sometimes the man at the conclusion of the exhibition mr gladstone expressed himself as having been greatly entertained and interested and spoke in warm and affecting terms of the instrumental good work the wild west had come to do in a brilliant little speech he proposed quote, success to the wild west show end quote, which aroused the enthusiasm of all present his demeanor on this and other occasions when he met the americans made clear to them the reason of the fascination he exercises over the masses of his countrymen then for colonel cody commenced a long series of invitations to breakfasts dinners luncheons midnight layouts and other attentions by which london society delights to honor a distinguished foreigner in addition to many receptions tendered him he was made an honorary member of most of the best clubs notably the reform club where he was presented to the prince of wales the duke of cambridge and many prominent gentlemen he was afterward a guest at a civic lunch at the mansion house with the lord mayor and lady mayoress a dinner at the beaufort club where that fine sportsman the duke of beaufort occupied the chair and a memorable evening at the savage club with mr wilson barrett who had just returned from america presiding and an attendance comprising such great spirits as mr henry irving john l toole and others great in literary artistic and histrionic london at the united arts club he was entertained by the duke of tech and at the st george's club by lord bruce lord woolmer lord lymington mr christopher sykes mr herbert gladstone and others subsequently he dined at mr irving's lady mcgregor's lady tenterden's mrs charles matthews widow of the great actor mrs j w mckay's lord randolph and lady churchill's edmund yates and at great marlow these are but a very few of the many invitations he was called upon to accept during this visit when mr and mrs la Boucher gave their grand garden production of a midsummer night's dream colonel cody was an honored guest he also accompanied lord charles beresford in the coaching club parade in hyde park and was prevented by press of business from accepting an invitation to a mount with the honorable artillery company of london the oldest volunteer in the kingdom in the parade in honor of her majesty the queen's birthday considering the fact that the indians were all new from the pine ridge agency and had never seen the exhibition and that one hundred of the ponies came direct from the plains of texas and had never been ridden or shot over it is a wonder how colonel cody with these social demands made upon his time succeeded in forming so good an exhibition on the opening day during all this fashionable hurly-burly colonel cody received the following letter marlborough house pall mall southwest april twenty sixth eighteen eighty seven dear sir i am desired by the prince of wales to thank you for your invitation his royal highness is anxious i should see you with reference to it perhaps therefore you would kindly make it convenient 
to call at marlborough house would it suit you to call at eleven thirty or five o'clock either to-morrow wednesday or thursday i am dear sir yours faithfully signed francis knollis private secretary this resulted in an arrangement to give a special and exclusive performance for h r h the prince and princess of wales although everything was still incomplete the track unfinished and spoiled by rainy weather and the hauling on of vast timbers the ground was in unspeakably bad condition the prince of wales being busily occupied in arranging matters for the queen's jubilee had but limited latitude in regard to time so postponement was out of the question the royal box was handsomely rigged out with american and english flags and the party conducted into the precincts of the wild west was a strong one numerically as well as in point of exalted rank the prince and princess of wales with their three daughters princesses louise victoria and maud led the way then came the princess louise and her husband the marquis of lorne the duke of cambridge h s h of tech and his son the comtesse de paris the crown prince of denmark followed by lady suffield and miss knollis lady cole colonel clark lord edward somerset and other high-placed attendants on the assembled royalties colonel cody was introduced by the prince of wales to the princess and introductions to the other exalted personages followed in which nate salisbury and the writer were included this was one of many meetings between his royal highness and colonel cody and before leaving london the prince presented to the colonel a very handsome diamond copy of his crest the three ostrich feathers mounted in gems and gold as a breastpin when the prince gave the signal the indians yelling like fiends galloped out from their ambuscade and swept round the enclosure like a whirlwind the effect was instantaneous and electric the prince rose from his seat and leaned eagerly over the front of the box and the whole party seemed thrilled at the spectacle from that moment everything was all right everybody was in capital form and the whole thing went off grandly at the finish an amusing incident occurred our lady shots on being presented cordially offered to shake hands with the princess be it known that feminine royalty offers the left hand back uppermost which the person presented is expected to reverently lift with the finger-tips and to salute with the lips however the princess got over the difficulty by taking their proffered hands and shaking them heartily then followed an inspection of the indian camp and a talk between the prince and red shirt his royal highness expressed through the interpreter his great delight at what he had seen and the princess personally offered him a welcome to england Quote, tell the great chief's wife said red shirt with much dignity that it gladdens my heart to hear her words of welcome while the ladies of the suite were petting john nelson's half-breed papoose the prince visited colonel cody's tent and while there seemed much interested in the gold-mounted sword presented to colonel cody by the generals of the united states army despite the muddy state of the ground the prince and his party made an inspection of the stables where two hundred bronco horses and other animals were quartered he particularly gratified colonel cody by demanding a full true and particular history of old charlie then in his twenty-first year who had carried his owner through so much arduous work on the plains and who once bore him over a flight of a hundred miles in nine hours and forty minutes when chased by hostile indians at seven o'clock the royal visit and our first full performance in england terminated by the prince presenting the contents of his cigarette case to red shirt a walk around the principal streets of london at this time would have shown how by anticipation the wild west had caught on to the popular imagination the windows of the london bookseller were full of editions of fenimore cooper's novels the pathfinder the deer slayer the last of the mohicans 
leather stocking and in short all that series of delightful romances which have placed the name of the american novelist on the same level with that of sir walter scott it was a real revival of trade for the booksellers who sold thousands of volumes of cooper where twenty years before they had sold them in dozens while colonel prentice ingram's realistic border romances of buffalo bill had a tremendous sale there is no doubt that the visit of the wild west to england set the population of the british islands to reading thinking and talking about their american kinsmen to an extent theretofore unknown it taught them to know more of the mighty nation beyond the atlantic and consequently to esteem it better than at any time within the limits of modern history the wild west having made its debut in london the following comment of the times and letters from general sherman will be appreciated by the reader american wild west exhibition the american exhibition which has attracted all the town to west brompton for the last few months was brought yesterday to an appropriate and dignified close a meeting of representative englishmen and americans was held under the presidency of lord lorne in support of the movement for establishing a court of arbitration for the settlement of disputes between this country and the united states at first sight it might seem to be a far cry from the wild west to an international court yet the connection is not really very remote exhibitions of american products and scenes from the wilder phases of american life certainly tend in some degree at least to bring america nearer to england they are partly cause and partly effect they are the effect of increased and increasing intercourse between the two countries and they tend to promote a still more intimate understanding those who went to be amused often stayed to be instructed the wild west was irresistible colonel cody suddenly found himself the hero of the london season notwithstanding his daily engagements and his punctual fulfillment of them he found time to go everywhere to see everything and to be seen by all the world all london contributed to his triumph and now the close of his show is selected as the occasion for promoting a great international movement with mr bright lord granville lord wolseley and lord lorne for its sponsors civilization itself consents to march onward in the train of buffalo bill colonel cody can achieve no greater triumph than this even if he some day realizes the design attributed to him of running the wild west show within the classic precincts of the coliseum at rome this association of the cause of international arbitration with the fortunes of the american wild west is not without its grotesque aspects but it has a serious import nevertheless after all the americans and the english are one stock nothing that is american comes altogether amiss to an englishman we are apt to think that american life is not picturesque we have been shown one of its most picturesque aspects it is true that red shirt would be as unusual a phenomenon in broadway as in cheapside but the wild west for all that is racy of the american soil we can easily imagine wall street for ourselves we need to be shown the cowboys of colorado hence it is no paradox to say that colonel cody has done his part in bringing america and england nearer together editorial from the london times november one eighteen eighty seven the following letters were received by buffalo bill from general w t sherman soon after the opening of the wild west in london fifth avenue hotel new york may eighth eighteen eighty seven dear cody i was much pleased to receive your dispatch of may fifth announcing the opening of the wild west in old london and that your first performance was graced by the presence of the prince and princess of wales i had penned a short answer to go by cable but it fell so far short of my thoughts that i tore it up and preferred the old-fashioned letter which i am sure you can afford to await after your departure in the state of nebraska 
I was impatient until the cable announced your safe arrival in the Thames, without the loss of a man or animal during the voyage. Since that time, our papers have kept us well posted, and I assure you that no one of your host of friends on this side of the water was more pleased to hear of your safe arrival and of your first exhibition than myself. I had, in 1872, the honor and great pleasure of meeting the Prince of Wales and the Princess Alexandra on board our fleet in Southampton Bay, and was struck by the manly, frank character of the Prince, and the extreme beauty and grace of the Princess. The simple fact that they honored your opening exhibition assures us all that the English people will not construe your party as a show, but a palpable illustration of the men and qualities which have enabled the United States to subdue the two thousand miles of our wild west continent and make it the home of civilization. You and I remember the time when we needed a strong military escort to go from Fort Riley in Kansas to Fort Kearney on the Platte, when emigrants to Colorado went armed and organized as soldiers, where now the old and young, rich and poor, sweep across the plains in palace cars with as much comfort as on a ride from London to Edinburgh. Your exhibition better illustrates the method by which this was accomplished than a thousand volumes of printed matter. The English people always have, and I hope always will, love, pluck, and endurance. You have exhibited both, and in nothing more than your present venture, and I assure you that you have my best wishes for success in your undertaking. Sincerely, your friend, W.T. Sherman. Fifth Avenue Hotel, New York, June 29, 1887. Honorable William F. Cody, London, England. Dear Cody, in common with all your countrymen, I want to let you know that I am not only gratified, but proud of your management and general behavior. So far as I can make out, you have been modest, graceful, and dignified in all you have done to illustrate the history of civilization on this continent during the past century. I am especially pleased with the graceful and pretty compliment paid you by the Princess of Wales, who rode in the Deadwood coach, while it was attacked by the Indians and rescued by the cowboys. Such things did occur in our days, and may never again. As near as I can estimate, there were, in 1865, about nine and a half millions of buffaloes on the plains between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains. All are now gone, killed for their meat, their skins and bones. This seems like desecration cruelty, and murder. Yet they have been replaced by twice as many neat cattle. At that date, there were about 165,000 Pawnees, Sioux, Cheyenne, Kiowas, and Arapahoes who depended on these buffaloes for their yearly food. They too are gone, and have been replaced by twice or thrice as many white men and women, who have made the earth to blossom as the rose, and who can be counted, taxed, and governed by the laws of nature and civilization. This change has been salutary, and will go on to the end. You have caught one epoch of the world's history, have illustrated it in the very heart of the modern world, London, and I want you to feel that on this side of the water we appreciate it. This drama must end. Days, years, and centuries follow fast, even the drama of civilization must have an end. All I aim to accomplish on this sheet of paper is to assure you that I fully recognize your work, and that the presence of the Queen, the beautiful Princess of Wales, the Prince, and British public, are marks of favor which reflect back on America sparks of light which illuminate many a house and cabin in the land where once you guided me honestly and faithfully in 1865 to 66 from Fort Riley to Kearney in Kansas and Nebraska. Sincerely, your friend, W.T. Sherman. End of chapter 23. Recording by Linda Johnson.
Chapter Twenty Four of Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke. A visit from Queen Victoria. By command of Her Majesty the Queen it must be understood that the queen never requests desires or invites even her own prime minister to her own dinner tables but commands invariably a special performance was given by the wild west the understanding being that her majesty and suite would take a private view of the performance the queen ever since the death of her husband nearly thirty years ago has cherished an invincible objection to appearing before great assemblages of her subjects she visits her parliament seldom the theatres never her latest knowledge of her greatest actors and actresses has been gained from private performances at windsor whither they have been commanded to entertain her and that at very infrequent intervals but as with mahomet and the mountain the wild west was altogether too colossal to take to windsor and so the queen came to the wild west an honor which was unique and unexampled in its character when this visit was announced the public would hardly believe it and if bets had been made at the clubs the odds on a rank outsider in the derby would have been nothing to the amount that would have been bet that it was a yankee hoax the news that her majesty would arrive at five o'clock and would require to see everything in an hour was in the nature of an astounding surprise to the management of the wild west but they determined to do the very best in their power and that settled it a dais for her majesty was erected and a box specially constructed draped with crimson velvet and decorated with orchids leaving plenty of accommodation for the attendant noblemen and all was made as bright and cheerful as possible with royal punctuality the sovereign lady and her suite rolled up in their carriages drove around the arena in state and dismounted at the entrance to the box the august company included besides her majesty their royal highnesses prince and princess of battenberg the marquis of lorne the dowager duchess of atoll and the honourable ethel cadogan sir henry and lady ponsonby general linadoc gardiner colonel sir henry ewart lord ronald gower and a collection of uniformed celebrities and brilliantly attired fair ladies who formed a veritable parterre of living flowers around the temporary throne during the introduction of the performers of the exhibition a remarkable incident occurred which is worthy of being specially recorded as usual in the entertainment the american flag carried by a graceful well-mounted horseman was introduced with the statement that it was quote, an emblem of peace and friendship to all the world end quote. as the standard bearer who on this occasion was colonel william f cody himself waved the proud emblem above his head her majesty rose from her seat and bowed deeply and impressively toward the banner the whole court party rose the ladies bowed the generals present saluted and the english noblemen took off their hats then there arose from the company such a genuine heart-stirring american yell as seemed to shake the sky it was a great event for the first time in history since the declaration of independence a sovereign of great britain had saluted the star-spangled banner and that banner was carried by buffalo bill it was an outward and visible sign of the extinction of that mutual prejudice sometimes almost amounting to race hatred that had severed the two nations from the times of washington and george the third to the present day the hatchet was buried at last and the wild west had been at the funeral the queen not only abandoned her original intention of remaining to see only the first acts but saw the whole thing through and wound up with a command that buffalo bill should be presented to her and her compliments were deliberate and unmeasured 
Mr. Nate Salisbury and Chief Redshirt, the latter gorgeous in his war paint and splendid feather trappings, were also presented. The chief's proud bearing seemed to take with the royal party immensely, and when he quietly declared that, quote, he had come a long way to see her majesty and felt glad, end quote, and strolled abruptly away, the queen smiled appreciatively as one who would say, I know a real duke when I see him. After inspecting the papooses, the queen's visit came to an end with a last command, expressed through Sir Henry Ponsonby, that a record of all she had seen should be sent on to Windsor. While receiving generous attention from the most prominent English people, Colonel Cody was by no means neglected by his own countrymen, many of whom were frequent visitors to the Wild West show, and added by their presence and influence much to the popularity of both the show and Colonel Cody himself. Honorable James G. Blaine, accompanied by his family, spent several hours in Colonel Cody's tent, and was a frequent visitor to the show. So also were Honorable Joseph Pulitzer, Chauncey M. Depew, Lawrence Jerome, Murat Halstead, General Hawley, Simon Cameron, and many other distinguished Americans. When the Honorable James G. Blaine visited the Wild West in London, accompanied by his wife and daughters, his carriage was driven through the royal gate to the grounds, and he was received by the English people as though he had been one of the royal highnesses. The Wild West band played the star-spangled banner, the air so loved by all true Americans, being received by the English audience rising and standing while Mr. Blaine and party alighted from their carriage and were escorted to the box set aside for them. When the distinguished party were seated, the band played Way Down in Maine and Yankee Doodle. After the entertainment, when Mr. Blaine took his departure, he was given three rousing cheers by the English, a tribute which he gracefully acknowledged and appreciated fully. So many prominent Americans, acquaintances of Colonel Cody, were in London at that time that it was determined to give them a novel entertainment that would serve the double purpose of regaling their appetites while affording an illustration of the wild habits of many Indian tribes. In accordance with this resolution, General Simon Cameron, as the guest of honor and about one hundred other Americans, including those named above, were invited to a rib-roast breakfast prepared by the Indians after the manner of their cooking when in their native homes. The large dining tent was gorgeously festooned and decorated for the occasion, and all the invited guests responded to the summons and arrived by nine o'clock in the morning. Before the tent, a fire had been made, around which were grouped a number of Indian cooks. A hole had been dug in the ground, and in this a great bed of coals was now made, over which was set a wooden tripod, from which was suspended several ribs of beef. An Indian, noted for his skill as a rib roaster, attended to the cooking by gently moving the meat over the hot coals for nearly half an hour, when it was removed to the quarters and there jointed, ready to be served. The guests were much interested in the process of cooking and were equally anxious to sample the product of Indian culinary art. The whole of the Indian tribes in camp breakfasted with the visitors, squatting on straw at the end of the long dining tent. Some dozen ribs were cooked and eaten in this primitive fashion, civilized and savage methods of eating confronting each other. The thoroughly typical breakfast over, excellent speeches, chiefly of a humorous nature, were made by the honored guest General Cameron, Colonel Cody, and others of the party. The breakfast was supplemented by an Indian dance, and thus ended the unique entertainment. On the 20th of June, a special morning exhibition of the Wild West was, by further command from Her Majesty, given to the kingly and princely guests of Queen Victoria upon the occasion of her jubilee. This was the third entertainment given to royalty in private, and surely never before in the history of the world 
had such a gathering honored a public entertainment the gathering of personages consisted of the king of denmark the king of saxony the king and queen of the belgians and the king of greece the crown prince of austria the prince and princess of sax meiningen the crown prince and princess of germany the crown prince of sweden and norway the princess victoria of prussia the duke of sparta the grand duke michael of russia prince george of greece prince louis of baden and last but not least the prince and princess of wales with their family besides a great host of lords and ladies innumerable a peculiar circumstance of the visit of queen victoria to the wild west exhibition may be mentioned here it was at the time of the queen's jubilee and there had gathered in london the largest and grandest assemblage of royalty ever before known in the world's history to do honor to the queen's reign of half a century it was the day before her majesty had appointed to meet all the royal personages that she came face to face with them all gathered together to do honor to the american entertainment of buffalo bill's wild west an honor indeed to the famous scout and which was commented upon by the prince of wales who referred to the great number of distinguished people present and that it was made possible by the fact that peace reigned upon earth with all nations who were there represented on this occasion the good old deadwood coach baptized in fire and blood so repeatedly on the plains had the honor of carrying on its time-honored timbers four kings and the prince of wales this elicited from his royal highness the remark to colonel cody colonel you never held four kings like these before to which colonel cody promptly and aptly replied i've held four kings but four kings and the prince of wales makes a royal flush such as no man ever held before at this the prince laughed heartily after this interesting gathering colonel cody received from marlborough house the following letter of thanks marlborough house pall mall southwest dear sir lieutenant general sir dighton proben comptroller and treasurer of the prince of wales household presents his compliments to colonel cody and is directed by his royal highness to forward him the accompanying pin as a souvenir of the performance of the wild west which colonel cody gave before the prince and princess of wales the kings of denmark belgium greece and saxony and other royal guests on monday last to all of whom the prince desires sir dighton proben to say the entertainment gave great satisfaction london june twenty two eighteen eighty seven this souvenir pin bore the crest and motto of the prince of wales and readers will perhaps be familiar with the story of how this crest and motto ich dien i serve were wrested from the king of bohemia at cressy by the black prince son of edward the third of england few men have had such honors bestowed upon them as has buffalo bill for he can also point with pride to a superb diamond crest presented him by queen victoria the elegant pin from the prince of wales while from prince george of russia he received a magnificent gold tankard of mosaic pattern other royal personages have also made him the recipient of many costly gifts while persons in private life have shown their appreciation of the record he has won in many ways the prince and princess and their sons and daughters were frequent visitors to the wild west during its stay in london upon one occasion his royal highness determined to try the novel sensation of a ride in the old stage and notwithstanding some objection on the part of her royal husband the princess also booked for inside passage and took it smilingly seeming highly delighted with the experience on one occasion the royal lady startled the managers of the show by an intimation that she would that evening attend the performance incognito the manager whose duty it was to receive her declared himself in a quote, middling tight fix unquote, 
as to where and how to seat her upon her arrival in answer to the question if she desired any particular position the lady replied certainly yes put me immediately among the people i like the people the manager with great thoughtfulness ushered her into one of the press boxes with colonel montague mrs clark and her brother the prince of denmark later to his surprise several of the newspaper boys came into the adjoining box and in order to avert the latter's suspicion of who the lady occupant of the box was the manager was compelled to address the royal lady and her escort as colonel and mrs jones friends of mine from texas the princess took the joke with becoming gravity and afterward confessed the evening was one of the pleasantest and funniest she had ever spent in her life and so amid the innumerable social junketings roastings and courtly functions added to hard work the london experiences of the wild west drew to a successful close End of chapter 24 Recording by Linda Johnson